All right, well, it is 6.05, so we're going to go ahead and get started. A couple announcements before uh, we get over to Dr. Finley's wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a safe zone training tomorrow at 6 p.m., same meeting time, um, and it should be the same length, I believe. Um, but if uh, anyone, AIAA or not, has uh, wanted to partake in that, um, it, it is interested at all in what OSTEM does, please feel free to join. Um, it'll be our, our second meeting this week. We were already double up, but it'll be a wonderful opportunity. And also, uh, AIAA board elections will be happening later this month. Uh, we'll probably be getting the uh, list of positions out to you guys in the you know, middle of the month. And then like third week or so around a uh, little after E-Days, we'll um, have candidacy and elections and uh, that'll uh, bring us to the end of the year, basically. So now uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Finley, who is a material science researcher here at Mines and uh, has some insight on how materials can work in aerospace for us. Yeah, great, okay. Um, can you enable screen sharing and I'll, I'll share a presentation? Absolutely. People are dropping uh, off the presentation uh, already. <laughs> I haven't even started talking yet. <laughs> Should be on for you. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks. It's, it's, I appreciate the opportunity to interact with um, the student chapter here. And um, I, I got an invitation from um, Samyukta back, I guess it was December, um, that we kind of planned this and, and thought it was an interesting opportunity. Um, so I put together something that I hope will be of interest to this group. Um, you know, it's a small group here, so feel free as I talk to jump in with questions or comments. You know, some of the stuff that I talk about, you all might have more knowledge about some of the mechanics of it um, than, than I do. So, so feel free to provide input as we go along. Um, we can kind of use this as an informal discussion. But there's my title, Alley Reliability in Aviation and Aerospace. Um, so let me give a little bit of background about myself that's perhaps a little bit relevant here. Um, so I've, I've been at Mines since 2008. Um, I actually did my undergraduate degree at Mines. I graduated with my bachelor's in 2001 from metallurgical materials engineering. Uh, but then I left, I, I did grad school at Georgia Tech and then eventually moved into the back after um, a couple opportunities, I ended up back at uh, Mines in 2008. Um, but primarily I like to break stuff, right? So I like to, um, I manage a mechanical testing lab and as you see that in the picture on the upper left. Um, so we do a lot of testing where we're breaking stuff. We're understanding deformation and fracture behavior in engineering alloys. And I, I primarily work with steel. So the logo you see on the right is a logo for our steel research center. So we work with about 27 uh, users and producers of steel products right now. Um, nothing in aerospace right now, actually, but we do have automotive and heavy equipment, uh, national labs um, involved. We, we used to have um, a nickel-based uh, alloy company that, that did some aerospace applications as well. Uh, but the market hasn't been very good for, for that and for uh, oil and gas, which was the other market. So the, they had to drop out of our center. Um, the bottom image there shows a picture from one of my courses. I teach a class. Actually, I'm teaching it right now. It's a grad level class on uh, failure analysis, analysis of metallurgical failures. Um, and that's a, a project that we had from a couple of years ago in the course um, that I thought was kind of a fun project. But it kind of demonstrates what we do in MME. So it's, it's, an, it's a forged axe blade. So I don't know if you can kind of see the outline of the axe blade. Um, and so we had a student that actually took the class that forged it and then he left it out overnight and actually fractured. And so they had this delayed fracture. So that provided a pretty good and interesting project for the course a couple years ago. But we have a lot of projects like that. Um, there was one year actually that I worked uh, with NASA. We, we got a couple of parts from the uh, Columbia Space Shuttle that, that we did a, bit, a little bit of analysis on. Um, it's, I thought about presenting some of that here, but it was kind of challenging to think about how to do that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have some, some stuff that we work on that's pretty relevant to aerospace and aviation, but really from the materials selection side. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about. So we'll, we'll spend a few minutes um, talking about alloy requirements and, and failure mechanisms in aerospace. And then I really just want to talk about kind of three main case studies to give an example of, of where alloy selection and durability, reliability is important um, in, the, in the aerospace industry. So the first one is what it's really relevant, right? We just, we just all experienced this. Um, in the news locally here in Colorado with United Airlines Flight 328 engine failure. Um, I'll talk about um, steels for high strength steels for landing gear applications. And I'll give some kind of history on the de Havilland Comet airplane. And again, some of the stuff you guys might have some different uh, background on, 
And so you're welcome to make comments as we go through. Does that sound okay? Sounds perfect. Great, great. Okay, so, so let's just talk about, you know, various types of aerospace alloys you might think about. And we could have a whole class on this, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna spend one slide on it instead. Um, but I'm gonna kind of have a specific message, right? So here's a group of four alloys that you might consider for aerospace applications. Uh, Nickel-based super alloys in the upper left, ultra-strength steels in the upper right, aluminum alloys lower left, and titanium alloys in the lower right. If you look at the, the scale bars that I put on these images, um, I, I'm, I put, these images for a very specific purpose, right? You don't see any parts or anything here, but the moral of the story is that um, alloys that are employed for aerospace applications are highly engineered materials. Um, for other applications as well, you know, automotive and energy infrastructure, but, but broadly alloys these days are really highly engineered materials and they're engineered down to the nano scale, right? So these are kind of micron bars, but it gives you a sense that some of the things that might be important, some of these features you see in here are submicron level features. So precipitates to give strengthening, um, you know, in, in, in multiple of these cases. This one has a lot of boundaries that give strengthening and toughness. Titanium alloys has, you know, orientations locally and grain, grain size refinement that gives, you know, strength at, at relatively light, light weight. So these are really highly engineered materials. And that's one of the things I kind of want to advocate uh, throughout this talk. All right, so, so let's just talk about how complicated um, alloy selection for aerospace can be um, in, a, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, aerospace applications are complex and in some cases, extreme environments, right? So let's just take the engine. If you look at the schematic on the right, it, it shows different stages of the engine coming from the intake all the way through the engine, right? And, and you can kind of imagine that there's different requirements based on the temperatures that are experienced in the front of the engine going all the way to the back. And then of course, temperature relates to things like corrosion that can occur in all these components. And so this is a really sophisticated environment that you have to think carefully about. And then when you start pairing materials together, you can have some other complications as well um, that, that make this a situation where you don't design this, you know, broadly for, you know, mass use. You really, you design this and when you put it into practice, you have to carefully monitor something like this to make sure nothing's happened to it. These aren't designed for infinite lives. These are designed for finite lives or the parts within them are designed for finite lives and to be replaced occasionally. Right, so if you look at the schematic on the left, this just gives you a sense of what materials are used through this, this aircraft on the right, right? So, so in the front of this, at the front of the engine, um, we have titanium alloys. As we move through towards the back, we move to a nickel-based super alloy um, situation um, because of the higher temperatures that are experienced there, right? So something lightweight and strong at slightly lower temperatures, something a little bit denser, but, but stronger and more fatigue resistant at those high temperatures um, in the higher temperature uh, region. Right? So this is, you know, just kind of gives you a glimpse of how complicated material selection can be. Here's another one. So, so the aircraft wing, right? So, so the aircraft wing is composed uh, primarily of aluminum, right? So we have a really fine, um, sorry, small, low thickness aluminum skin that wraps around the wing. And then there are aluminum um, parts that form the structure of the wing. So these are machined or extruded um, parts that form the, the interior structure of the wing. And so the primary um, material need there is lightweight and relatively high strength, and maybe some fatigue resistance as this wing goes up and down. Right? So, so another part of the, you know, away from the engine, we, we care a lot more about weight. And this is, you know, the, what, what the whole kind of whole of the um, airplane is composed of is a structure kind of like this. And then we go to landing gear, right? So, so in landing gear applications, um, I like this picture because it's a commercial aircraft. It gives you a sense of scale landing gear, but there's a lot of other things you consider. So, so these landing gear um, structures are primarily composed of steel. And in fact, if you look at the percent by weight of material use in an airplane, I think the majority of it is actually steel, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, by, by volume, it's probably mostly aluminum, but by weight, it's mostly steel. And most of that steel is going in landing gear. And so that, the reason for that is because, you know, as landing gear, uh, is employed, it has to have pretty high strength and really good impact resistance, um, maybe some fatigue resistance as well in some of these components as we'll, as we'll talk about in some, some of these examples. Um, but in steel kind of fits that billing very well. So you can sacrifice weight here to have better um, mechanical performance in these applications. Any comments so far? Any questions so far? 
Okay, I'll keep going. If you have a question in chat and I miss it, maybe uh, um, someone can just holler at me to make sure I, I catch it. Um, okay, so so let's talk about failures, right? So in a lot of ways, um, air, airplanes and aircraft are really complicated structures and it's really hard to avoid failures in them. So here's a couple of tables that I pulled um, and I actually use these in my failure analysis class. The table on the left it shows the, the causes of failure in aircraft components. If you look kind of closely at that, um, you see the fatigue is by far the number one cause, right? So <laughs> I was talking to somebody the other day and, and he called an airplane a flying fatigue machine, right? So it's kind of a test machine for fatigue and you have to be really careful with that um, for fatigue in a, in a variety of scenarios. Uh, overload fracture, you know, so just pulling on something until it breaks is number two. And then you have some corrosion mechanisms and wear that kind of follow, but, but fatigue is by far the highest, um, uh, largest cause of failure in aircraft components. Um, so, so that's something to think about. And then if you think about kind of what the root cause of that is, so fatigue is, is a design issue, but where does that come from? The number one reason that you have fatigue failures is improper maintenance, right? So not, not inspecting things in a critical enough way, um, not performing maintenance like welds or repairs in, in the right way. Um, so so that's, that's really critical, you know, because maintenance of, of these flying machines is, is important and they're inspected regularly and that inspection, as we'll talk about later, is, is absolutely critical in, in, in reliability aircraft. Um, so fabric, fabrication defects, which actually I think kind of goes along with maintenance is number two. Sometimes there's a design deficiency, just like any, any engineered part. Um, abnormal service, I was surprised that this was a little bit low on the list. I thought this would be higher, but abnormal service is kind of you know, number four. So let's start with, with uh, the United Airlines, not flight, flight, sorry for that typo. Let's start with the United Airlines Flight 328. Let's just kind of watch this video. Maybe you probably But this is what happened as the United Airlines Flight 328 took out out of Denver. We'll look at some facts in a second, but it's climbing up out of the Denver airport uh, going west. And this is a video that somebody took out of their window. And I don't know about you, but I would be pretty nervous if I was taking this video out, video out of my window. I'm a little bit less nervous now after learning what I did for this presentation. Um, but, but this is, I think, pretty dramatic, <laughs> pretty interesting. How many of you have seen this video? Has everybody seen it? I have, yes. Okay, so that's that's good on that. So so let's go look at the facts. So this is a flight from Denver to Honolulu. As we just saw, it was a right engine failure, and this is a Pratt and Whitney Pratt and Whitney engine, and this is a pretty relevant um, aspect because this is not the only Pratt and Whitney engine like this that's failed. Um, and it happened as it was climbing on Denver, so at altitude of about twelve thousand five hundred feet. And it happened at about a time, kind of interestingly, where the pilots advanced the power because they wanted to get out of the turbulence. Um, and so, so that may have had kind of something to do with the final fracture of the blade. It probably wasn't the primary cause of failure, but it may have pushed the engine kind of over the edge. And we'll, we'll talk about what, what exactly happened. I think the most critical thing is, is at the bottom, there's no injuries. And there have been other failures like this that have had you know, minimal injuries compared to what, what happened. All right, looks like I have a chat. Right, what I'm looking at. Okay, Victoria said that she saw it. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. Okay, so so here's here's the engine. So so they've actually the NTSB has already started coming out with some failure reports on this, and and this is kind of the space that we live in and think about failure analysis of metals. So do you remember what material is used at the front of these engines? In these fan blades, you remember what material is used in the front of these engines? All right, you guys are all shy. I'm gonna to try to push you out of being shy, but this, these are titanium blades, right? So, so if you remember if that schematic I showed you earlier, at the front of these engines, these are, these are primarily titanium alloys that are used. So something called TIE-6-4. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty common titanium alloy, um, titanium-6 aluminum-4 vanadium. And in, in, in aerospace, you can, you can use um, relatively expensive materials like titanium because you know, these are high-end parts. There's not many of them, right? So these are, these are titanium blades. So what, what happened though, if you look at this picture on the left, you see two fractured blades, and here's a higher magnification or higher um, uh, scale uh, image of it. One blade failed, and it failed by fatigue. And we'll talk a little bit more about fatigue in a second. 
And probably what happened is that this, the blade, this blade came off and hit the second blade and caused an overload fracture of the second blade. So really this was the culprit right here of everything that we saw in that video is a fatigue failure of this, this particular fan blade. All right, and so they've already come out and started taking what we call fractographs or fracture surface images. So, so this picture right here, it's just looking down the blade right at the area where it fractured. And this is, you know, it has some pretty classical features associated with, with fatigue and overload fracture. But what they determined is that within this blade, and it's kind of interesting, you can see it's a hollow blade. And it's ho obviously hollow because they want to have uh, weight savings within this blade. They feel like they still had enough structural integrity um, even with these hollowed out cores to make sure nothing happened. And I think that's true, um, but there's some caveats to that. But right around this region, you see what's, what, what's called a beach mark. And this beach mark just indicates the progression of a fatigue crack. And this fatigue crack started right at this stress concentration right here. So you, you've probably learned, or maybe, maybe some of you have learned about uh, mechanical stress concentrations. Well, we have one right here. And it caused a crack to form and it propagated outwards and eventually got big enough that this whole blade just broke. In the next cycle. So, so as the as the pirate as the pilots were um, adding extra power um, to get out of that that turbulent region, um, they probably caused um, an overload fracture um, from that kind of final, that final crack size. But that wasn't the primary reason. That crack was growing anyway. It was going to fail soon, no matter what. All right. So, Amanda, yeah, thanks for asking a question. Is that on the inside of the blade? How do they check for that before it fails? And I'll talk about that. So, yeah. So this is. Let me go back. So this is if we're looking down. So this is you know looking down, I think kind of right in this segment right here in the blade. Does that make sense, Amanda? Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. So so let's talk a little bit about fatigue. And, and some of you are probably familiar with fatigue and remember it from your mechanics and materials class. Some of you may not have had that yet. But fatigue is just basically cycling something over and over again. So we if you think about it as a wave, right? Over time, we increase stress decrease stress, increase stress, decrease stress over and over and over again. Right? So a rotating part like a blade is kind of a classic example of fatigue, right? So as it rotates, you can think about it, there's a cyclic stress imposed upon it um, as, it, as that part rotates. And, and fan blades get a lot of fatigue cycles, actually. Um, you can do different kind of waveforms, and we'll talk about this one a little bit later. So you can go up to a peak stress and hold, and go down to the lower stress and hold, and so on. So there's some critical parameters in fatigue. Uh, one of them, you know, so just, just like a wave in physics, one of those is a stress amplitude. So that's just the peak stress minus the minimum stress divided by two. So that's the amplitude. And of course, another one is the mean stress. So what the average of these two stresses is. So the higher the mean stress, typically the, the worse uh, the performance is uh, of a particular material or part, right? But we'll, we'll, we'll think mostly about this amplitude effect next. Right, so when we cycle something, right, materials have um, what we call elastic plastic behavior, right? So if we're kind of cycling something in the elastic regime, right, where it's behaved, the material's kind of behaving like a rubber band, all the deformations recover no matter how we load it, it looks pretty boring, it looks like this. And so if you can cycle something kind of in this regime for a long, long time without failure, right? And so it's so like millions of cycles, tens of millions of cycles without failure. However, fatigue gets kind of tricky because fatigue is hard to design for because it can happen at stresses that are really low, maybe just a little bit bigger than this one, where you just have a little bit of damage that starts at a microstructural level and then propagates to something much bigger eventually. Right? Anyway, so, so this is something called high cycle fatigue, where we could, we could expose the material to tens of millions of cycles without failure. As we start to get to higher stresses, we start to get a little bit of plasticity in the material, so the material starts yielding. And as we unload it, we create a hysteresis loop. And we won't go too much into this, but the moral of the story is that as you start to get some, some plasticity, you, you create more damage, and then you have a finite life situation. And a lot of materials for aer aerospace and, and airplane applications are, are designed for finite lives, actually, uh, just because they can be inspected and they have to be you know, pretty high performance. It'd be too challenging not to design them for a finite life. All right, so if we just start with a smooth specimen, right? So we don't have any flaws or anything in the specimen, and we take, take different specimens and plot stress amplitude versus the number of cycles it takes to fail them, we get a plot that looks like this. So again, if we're at a low enough stress, we call this the endurance limit, the material will never fail. It, it'll go 10 million cycles or 100 million cycles, it just won't matter, it'll never fail. In aerospace applications though, you typically operate up in here at lower lives where you have a fine, you design the material for a finite life. So you know what stress you're imposing on it, 
you know how many cycles to fill it should have, and you kind of figure out, okay, when can I, when do I need to inspect it, or when do I need to take it out of service, uh, based on what I know about the material and the and the part. That makes sense. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of hit on that later. So is everybody with me so far? Any, any big questions about? I've covered some concepts quickly, but I just want you to kind of get the essence of them. Does everybody kind of understand the essence of them? Thanks, Amanda. Okay, all right, so I'll keep going then. Okay, so here's some typical machines that we use for fatigue testing, right? So we can you know, take something in our, in our servo hydraulic frames and just pull on it and push, pull on and compress on it over and over and over again. Uh, we could take something like this and we could fix it on one side and we can bend it over and over and over again. And we could do all sorts of different stress situations to test fatigue life of components. So let me just show you a couple of videos. So here's, this is a bending fatigue test. So it's fixed over on one side. It has a little fillet to simulate a stress concentration on this side. And we bend it over and over and over again. Here's another one. At the bottom, this is torsion. So it's fixed on this side. And it's being torqued on the other side. So it's a simulated torsional load. Um, these are actually low speed videos. If we want to get something to 10 million cycles, we need several days to do that. So we typically run these like at 30 hertz or so. And then it breaks, right? So, so that's right at the end of a fatigue test where, where we run something to 30 hertz and then it finally broke um, towards the end in, in torsion. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so if we have a flaw though, if we have a, a crack in the material to start with, we have something called fatigue crack growth. And so when we've had fatigue crack growth, we plot how fast the crack is growing on this axis. And then something called the stress intensity on this axis. So how, how much the stress is intensified at the crack tip. And, and this is really relevant for aerospace because this, this linear region in here, we can directly relate this, this, this stress intensity to how fast the fatigue is growing on a log log scale in a linear way. So, so in aerospace, they use this linear region for design quite often. In fact, this was, coined by somebody named Paul Paris. Uh, Paul Paris worked for NASA, and, and he's the one who kind of developed this, this methodology for using this region to predict lives of parts based on the rate of crack growth in this linear region. All right, so, so some different approaches that are used in fatigue is, you know, you can do something called the safe life approach, where you simulate the fatigue loads in a lab, like I just showed you, and you predict their service life, and then take them out of, out of service once they've exceeded you know, some fraction of their life. You can have something called the defect tolerant approach where you assume there's a crack in the material and you use something like the plot I just showed you to calculate the remaining service life. But typically in aerospace, what they use is something called the retirement for cause approach for the really critical and high-end parts. And what they do is they really carefully monitor the parts and they really carefully monitor the service conditions. And based on those, they can kind of estimate stresses and based on those, they can determine the remaining time until they need to inspect the part. So aircraft engines, <coughs> excuse me, are inspected um, at certain intervals based on how long they think the part can go before they need to look at it again to see if there's a flaw. They know, this is kind of weird to think about, right? They know there's cracks in these engines. They just need to figure out how long it's going to take those cracks to become of a critical size when they need to worry about them. Now, if something happens, like, you know, part fails, this is another key thing. As engineers, we need to think about how to build in redundancy. So if something happens, how can the, the, the parts or even the plane survive um, to, you know, to get to the ground safely and without any injuries like we saw in, in the United Airlines flight? Okay, so this is kind of, this, this relates to uh, Amanda's question. So they utilize something called non-destructive evaluation to inspect these, these engines. So let's go back to the Pratt & Whitney engine. So, so this isn't the first time that that's happened. This is a picture of another engine that failed in a very similar way in 2018. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that one a little bit in a second. Um, but to do this, they use something called thermal acoustic imaging, right? So they, they look for cracks in these blades um, at, at certain intervals. And so the interval they used to use was about 6,500 cycles. They've since reduced that down to 1,000 cycles. Um, there's different techniques. This is a particular one that Pratt & Whitney has highlighted as like a novel technique Use. And I think there is some, some value to it, but clearly they need to do better. Um, thermal acoustic imaging is basically where they send a sound wave to the part, and that sound wave causes friction. So if, any, if there's any open surface within the part, it causes friction in that open surface. And when it causes friction, it causes heating. 
And then this, this imaging technology can detect that heat and figure out if there's a flaw there. So it's a pretty interesting thing, but you know, technicians have to be highly trained and have to be very careful in doing this to make sure they don't miss something. So in this particular blade, it, this particular blade that failed in 2018 experienced almost 3000 cycles after the last inspection. They thought it could go up to 6,500, but apparently it couldn't. And so based on this, that's when they started reducing the inspection intervals on, on these blades. Okay, so if we look at these two failures, um, 2018 versus 2020, this is the 2021 that I just, sorry, 2021, I, can't, I don't even know what year it is. This is the 2021 blade that we just looked at. This is the 2018 blade, same thing. You see kind of this, this uh, beach mark and this oxidized region showing where the petite crack grew. It's at a slightly different location, but that just, I think, indicates that the stress around this, this kind of filleted region is pretty comparable and so the tea crack can kind of nucleate and grow anywhere within this region. And then if you, you know, look at even closer in the fracture surface up here, you see uh, some kind of signs of fatigue in this titanium alloy. So this is the surface, and this is the actual fracture path that the, the tea crack took at a pretty small scale. So this is probably like a you know, 20 micron scale within this region. So some similarities um, within, within this one. Um, it was an altitude of 34,000 feet, but it's pretty close to takeoff, I think, if I remember correctly. What's a little bit leery about this one is that um, in these cases, in this case, there was a paint imperfection that was found through thermal acoustic imaging, or that's what they classified it as. So they said they, they saw an imperfection and they thought, oh, that's just paint. And they saw it both in 2010 and 2015. So they had a chance to take this engine out of service, uh, but they didn't because this, this, this imaging method, this, this non-destructive valuation method wasn't perfect. Um, and so they, they, they classified it incorrectly and then ultimately this blade failed, right? So these are, these are really important things to think about. The inspection and the maintenance of these blades is really critical to think about. Okay, but with these engines, like I talked about, they built in redundancy. Um, and so if you look carefully at these engines, the engine is still relatively intact. The cowling, the cowling fell off. And I don't know, maybe some of you saw pictures of the cowling in somebody's yard <laughs> um, and, and things that were crushed on the ground. But these engines are designed to have containment of any debris that happens when a blade fails. So they, they envision the scenario and they're designed so that the debris from this doesn't fly out and hit critical parts of the plane and cause injuries or, or worse, or take the plane down. Um, so there have been a couple of cases where, I think, um, I think one specific case where a piece of the blade came and hit a window. And I think that actually caused an issue because it sucked somebody out of the plane. So that's, that's, that's kind of what the biggest issue this has caused, but primarily when this has happened, um, there's been very limited um, injury issues and they've been able to get the plane safely on the ground, primarily because of this containment ring that's designed in. Okay, so, so I guess any questions or comments on that before we shift gears? I have a quick question, Dr. Finley. Yeah, sure, Matt. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, Pratt Whitney um, decided to change up or alter their uh, thermal acoustic uh, non-destructive testing after the uh, recent event. You know, I haven't heard anything, Matt. I'm not sure. That, that's a good question. I still think they, they think that's a pretty um, viable method to, to use, and it's used in other industries. So I, everything I've read, I haven't seen that method criticized. <laughs> what I have seen criticized is the training that the operators mm -hmm. receive. Sure. And use it. Okay. It's a lot less extensive than some other techniques. And so I, my guess is they'll, they'll end up modifying the training procedures. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So other questions? All right. So let's talk about landing gear for a few slides. Um, so this is kind of an interesting video that I found. Uh -huh. Accelerate. <laughs> Mamy 
I'll, I'll pause for a second, Jerry, while the video plays. Okay, so so those are those. Are, that's a that's a plain landing without any landing gear, and I guess that's another example of redundancy, where you know skilled pilots, um, even with when a landing gear fails, um, can still land a plane in a pretty smooth way. I mean, it's pretty uh, to me that video is just just amazing. Um, clearly, there's damage to the plane, but it's just amazing. So in landing gear, we typically use ultra high strength steels, and I'm not going to go into details of these, but we use something a microstructure called tempered margin site. Again, look at the scale bar here. This is a really fine microstructure where things are designed in at the submicron level to give, give those materials high strength, high toughness, and even good fatigue resistance. And here's an even higher resolution image kind of showing, you know, it's composed of things that we know are there that's given, in, given the material these properties. Um, there's some other options that have been produced in recent years um, that, that also have some enhanced corrosion resistance. You know, steel is not very corrosion resistant overall. It has to be coated. Um, in, in corrosion applications. <clears throat> but there's been some steels for these high-end applications we've designed with more chromium <clears throat> to have more corrosion resistance. Okay, so landing gear failures are, are pretty important though. Um, and that, that's the reason I'm kind of highlighting them. So this pie chart that I found, uh, landing gear systems are about 10, almost 10% 10 of the reasons that Boeing 737s fail. Um, and I don't really know how often Boeing 737s fail, I hope it's not that off. I hope this 10% is like one failure. Um, but but it's, I guess it's an important thing to think about is that landing systems um, are, are can be vulnerable to failure. So here's a couple of examples. So, so the one on the left um, is from a civil aircraft. And I think this one actually failed uh, while it was on the runway taxiing out to take off. So that's the best time to fail probably for a landing gear is before you take off so nothing happens. Um, but what I want to kind of highlight is if you look at this fracture surface on the bottom left, what you see is this really flat region. And you see these, these concave marks that point back to the fracture origin. And again, these are called beach marks. And so this is a pretty good indication of fatigue. In fact, it's a very good indication of fatigue. So landing gear failures are often associated with fatigue, just like we talked about with the engine, just a different part of the machine. So, you know, we started off talking about that around 60% of aircraft failures are due to fatigue. We've already seen two pretty good examples of that. Uh, the one on the right is from a Brazilian um, military aircraft. Uh, it's a nose landing gear failure. And again, if you look at the fracture surface, you see these, these markings that are again called beach marks and a really flat fracture, and that's an indication of fatigue. What's really interesting about this one is that you see a little bit of paint here on the fracture surface. And so does anybody know what that implies? If we see paint right here on the fracture surface, what does that indicate? Does that mean that the part failed uh, prior to being painted? Yeah, so paint seeped in? Yeah, exactly. So it means that there was a crack there when they painted the part already. And so that could have been a maintenance or a replacement or something. Maybe it was a used part they just repainted, but there was already a crack there at, at some point when they painted it and put it back into service. Yeah, and so you know, this is this is the picture of that aircraft. <laughs> it's a pretty dramatic picture, I think. I'm sorry, this is not that aircraft. That was this is an aircraft in Florida that uh, just had a landing gear failure uh, a few weeks ago, and you can see the 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 jet is nose down on the on the runway, and unfortunately that one failed before it uh, went out. Also, um, so no nobody's hurt or anything in that one. Okay, so so that was just kind of brief again talking about fatigue applications, landing gear. Let's talk about the de Havilland Comet, um, because I think this is a really interesting history overall for um, you know, airspace and, and aircraft. Um, 
So this is a picture of the de Havilland comet. Um, and I guess the notable thing about this is this is the first jetliner that was designed for civil service. And we'll talk about some facts associated with that. As I note here, if you look closely, this one is a pretty unique design because the engines are embedded in the wing as opposed to what they primarily are now, which is what we saw with the, the Pratt & Whitney engine is that it's outside of the wing. So that, that, I guess that has some advantages, but the disadvantage is it's harder to contain damage that originates in the wing if you have something fail there. So that's kind of an interesting design side note, but it's not really important to what we're gonna talk about. Um, so here are the facts. It was commissioned um, post-World War II by the United Kingdom. Um, again, with the foresight saying, okay, we're gonna have more people traveling. How do we make that more efficient and faster? And so typically at the time they're using prop planes that are traveling about half the altitude. So maybe 20,000 feet, I don't remember the exact number, uh, but this plane was designed to cruise at 40,000 feet at much higher speeds. So engines operate faster at higher, I'm sorry, engines operate at higher efficiency at higher altitudes. And so there's some real advantages to going into this, this altitude and you can go faster with, with the jet engine, obviously. Um, but you know this is really at the forefront of design. Nobody had done anything like this. So there's all sorts of interesting things that came from this. You know, they had to think about how they joined things together on the plane, especially near the engine and near the windows. The engines were brand new. The cabin design was completely different. They had to pressurize the cabin to, uh, very differently to 40,000 feet than they were doing when, they were going, when planes were just going up to 20,000 feet. And that's actually a very critical thing that we'll talk about. All right, so, so this plane was, was a little bit vulnerable to accidents and, and some of them were not linked to what we're gonna talk about, but you know, all sorts of kind of things happened to it. Um, for, a while, for a while, it was very reliable. In fact, you know, royalty from the United Kingdom flew in the plane safely. Um, but in January 8th, 1954, um, there was a flight from Rome to London. And in those days, they didn't have the big fuselages and so they didn't go um, very long distances. So this, this was a multi-stop route going from Singapore to London. It was on one of its final legs going from Rome to London. And the plane crashed while cl climbing to 27,000 feet near the island of Elba um, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and just, it get kind of, just kind of disintegrated. So, so they didn't at that time actually look at the wreckage of planes when they went back and looked at why they failed. So they had some engineers get together and kind of speculate what happened so, and made improvements on a plane. And, and ultimately the plane got a certification back, and was able to, to fly again. But a few months later, April 8th, there's a flight from Rome to Cairo and the exact same thing happened. The plane crashed again near the top of his ascent at 35,000 feet and just disintegrated. And so at that point they, they, had, they said, okay, we don't really know what's going on here. We need to do a deeper dive into what's, what's happening. And everybody clearly perished on these flights. Um, they weren't built to be very big. Um, so I think they're built for about 40 passengers plus the crew. Uh, but, you know, pretty tragic accidents overall. All right, so if you think about fatigue, right, the, the, these, these accidents happened in the cabin. And so, like I talked about before, going to 40,000 feet was no small feat for the cabin because it, you had to pressurize the cabin up to higher pressures than you would uh, with, with lower altitudes, right? So that, that creates a fatigue cycle. So you take off, you pressurize the cabin, you hold the stress during flight, and then you unload. And when the plane takes off, you do it again. Right, so every time the plane, plane takes off and lands, you have a fatigue cycle within the airplane. So they actually did some pre-testing to make sure they thought the plane could withstand the loads it would um, in the air, but that wasn't quite sufficient. So after the plane failed, they went back and they tested other planes to see if they could simulate what would happen um, in, in over a certain number of cycles. And they did it with water. And the reason they did it with water is because if, you know, if they did it with air, and the plane failed to be like a bomb with the pressure release. So, so they did it with water. And what you see here is this water box. And so planes actually sit in the water and then they pressurize it with water. They didn't want the weight of the plane to, to play a factor in the, in the, fatigue, to, in the fatigue performance. So they put it in this water box and they pressurize it with water. And they did, they pressurized and depressurized over and over and over again. And ultimately what they found is that, that there were about 3000 flight cycles before they found a fatigue crack. And a fatigue crack grew about less than two millimeters before the plane failed. So this is a real challenge, right? You have to be able to check a crack that's less than two millimeters in size before the, before the plane actually failed. And, and that's, that's pretty tiny. I don't know what you think, but that's pretty tiny. And I guess importantly, it failed from a rivet hole. Oftentimes you'll hear, hear people say that these failures occurred around the windows. 
is associated with the square nature of the windows, and that's not quite it. It is associated with the windows and how they had to join the material near the windows, but primarily these, fail, these failures happen near rivet holes or bolt holes um, in, the, in the airplane. And so what they found is that there's a number of locations that are vulnerable, and they, again, they're all near windows. Um, so this, this forward port escape hatch is one vulnerable site. Uh, there's a weird rear detection window that was another vulnerable site. I think this port number seven window is, is when they reconstructed the accident, this is where they originally thought that the, um, the, the crack started. I think in more recent years, and I couldn't find a good report on it, they figured out that that actually wasn't the case. It actually started further up in the plane. So there's a 2015 release of information that they thought that the crack started up here. But it was all near bolt holes or rivet holes uh, near the windows. Right, so, so that, and that's, that's pretty interesting. But, but one of the things that, that this led to was, was better aircraft reconstruction after an accident. And so, so they figured out technology to go into the sea and find their parts. They, I think they ended up finding about 80% of the plane and were basically able to piece it back together and find you know, what was probably a pretty small fatigue crack out of that damage near, near these windows. Um, so, so I thought that was, that was really fascinating. An important legacy though, right? So, so de Havilland continued to make their comment for, for several years, um, so a couple decades, I think. And in fact, they were the first commercial jet craft to cross the Atlantic Ocean. But, but basically, you know, they lost a lot of money. They lost their reputation. They lost their leadership in the area. So Boeing and Douglas basically came in and took over as a primary airplane manufacturers because of the sacrifices that, that de Havilland made. Um, though, you know, I think they, there's kind of off record comments that they admit they would have made the same mistakes. It just de Havilland kind of was there first, right? So, so de Havilland pushed the brink and unfortunately lives were lost, but um, it's kind of an interesting ethical, ethical question about, you know, the, the sacrifices that were made for the aircraft and aerospace industry associated with these plane manufacturers because they, they really did push the, push the edge of design and, and material selection and, and aircraft reconstruction and all that stuff. Uh, so it's a tragic story, but a really important one for where we, now, where we are now with, um, with uh, our um, aircraft technology. So, so I'll wrap it up there and, and take any questions you have, but I guess in summary, you, you know, you can think of, the, of these airplanes and the aerospace industry of, of being um, materials or being composed of materials that are used in very extreme environments, um, but these materials are highly engineered. And so, so they're, they're suitable for these environments. Um, the other noteworthy thing I think is that, you know, often these parts are designed for finite lives and therefore they require really high quality maintenance and high quality inspection, to make sure nothing's wrong uh, for future service. Um, and you know, I think you guys are probably aware of this over, overall anyway, but I think there's a lot of opportunities for design of aircraft technology for enhanced performance and reliability because these environments are challenging. We're, we're gonna push and bring further, right? We're gonna wanna go higher and faster um, and, and have other things that we wanna do, you know, light weighting within the plane that are gonna push the brink of, of material selection and performance. And, I think there's good opportunity there. All right, so I'm happy to, that that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. It looks like Victoria has one already. So Victoria asks, how do you test material components in different ambient conditions? Or do you use vacuum cold chambers or accommodation? Uh, what about humidity and heat? Um, that's, a, that's a really excellent question. And the answer is yes to all of that. Um, so, you know, at Mines, for example, and in other places, we have the capability to test materials um, in a variety of loading configurations at, at really high temperatures, up to like 1200 degrees Celsius, um, at really low temperatures, so cryogenic, cryogenic temperatures down to liquid nitrogen temperature. Um, you hit on, you know, a vacuum versus, versus humidity and heat. That's really critical for aircraft. Um, so, um, so oxidation is something that's important in conjunction with the mechanical behavior of some of these aircraft components, for example, in engines. And so we do think about those things in, in testing. Um, so if you just want to assess the material behavior by itself, you may be put in a vacuum. But then if you want to assess the material behavior in conjunction with the environment, you put it in an oxidizing environment and test it. Um, so, so yeah, I think all the factors you hit on, including humidity, are, can be very critical in the performance of the part. Humidity produces something called, you know, produces hydrogen. Um, and hydrogen can be very deleterious to metals. Um, we won't get into that today, but that's, that can be a very important thing for uh, the reliability of, of metal service. Other questions? Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks, Victoria. I have a question. Sure. 
So during the landing gear failure case study, you mentioned that there were some built-in redundancies to, I guess, ensure that the plane landed safely if or in the event of a landing gear failure. Is there some sort of a, a structural or wear uh, reinforce wear? I guess wear resistant reinforcement on the bottom of the fuselage so that in the event of a um, landing gear failure, I guess it's pretty much ensured that the the bottom of the fuselage will hold up against all of that uh, friction and heat generated. That's really a question, Matt, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Does somebody else on the call know the answer to that? I I didn't look into that. I it's either that or, or the materials that they use at the bottom of the plane, including aluminum alloys, they know are going to be wear resistant at least for one cycle, <laughs> skidding down the front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody else know the answer to that question? Yeah. Good question, Matt. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, well, um, maybe um, maybe what I can do is 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 you know you have you have my contact information. So if you know if a question pops up and you want to send it to me, I'm I'm happy to answer it. I'm happy to get to by, get to it by email. Um, again, you know, thanks for the time to present to you today. I I, I enjoy putting this presentation together. It's the topic that I think about sometimes, um, but not often. So this is a kind of a fun opportunity for me. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for uh, all of your words, Dr. Finley. And good luck with the rest of the semester. I hope it goes well for all of you. Thank you. So we certainly hope so too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.